Hello, everybody, and welcome to another OpenShift Commons briefing. Today is Transformation Friday, and as we are wont to do on Fridays, is we pull somebody that makes us think big or little ideas um, and uh, have them share some of their insights. And today, I'm really pleased. Um, we're going to have a great talk, hopefully, uh, and an introduction to Wardley mapping, um, which I think everybody has heard about, but not everybody has used. Um, and we're going to try and apply it to a few things um, that are near and dear to my heart. But to drive us through this conversation um, and to um, challenge us a little bit, I think uh, Ben Mosier from Hired Thought is here. And I'm going to let him introduce himself. And then we're going to fly through some interesting things. It's going to be a very different kind of briefing. Um, and if you see in the chat, um, there'll be a little link to a new piece of software for all of us. Um, so yeah, it's a total experiment today. Um, we're going to try using Miro to drive this um, conversation as well. So um, take it away, Ben. Explain, explain yourself, introduce yourself, and let's do some hand waving and chatting and figure this Wardley thing out. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> explain yourself. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Ben Mosier. I run a, a little website called learnwardleymapping.com. And I'm super excited to share a little bit of Wardley mapping with you today. So kind of like the basic idea of um, the session, I think, is I'm going to give you my somewhat unorthodox introduction to Wardley mapping. I'm going to do it in Miro. Um, and then maybe uh, Diane and I will, will do a little bit of mapping. And then maybe we can explore this bigger question of how do we make sense of sort of technology ecosystems. Um, and make sense of is kind of the, the key words there. Like we're not trying to find the answer. We're not trying to the, discover, you know, the meaning of life, the universe, and everything. But uh, if we can make a little bit more sense of the way everything is is sort of fitting together, maybe um, that'll help us make good decisions. So anyone who is watching on the live stream, who wants to, uh, or, or like is in the in the blue jeans call, like feel free to join us in Miro. You can go to lwm.events/osc, and as you're kind of following along in the conversation, um, what I'll say is feel, please feel welcome to add your questions in the, uh, in the sort of like the section up here with all the sticky notes. Um, we'll kind of come circle back around and find um, time to answer those as we go along. And if in worst case, you can always email me and we can, uh, we can talk about that later. So, all right, maybe it's time to, to get into this worthy mapping thing. So I'm going to go straight into worthy mapping. So the person on the left is a gentleman by the name of Simon Morley. My friend uh, Kat Swatel says that Simon is someone who lives in a swamp in the UK, kind of like a, a wizard. <laughs> and he made this interesting kind of technique that's Creative Commons and that we'll talk about more in a second. Uh, Simon is supposedly chaotic evil, um, whereas I, I've decided this morning that I'm just chaotic. Um, so uh, you can find Simon on Twitter at Swordly. You can find me on Twitter at Hired Thought. And uh, the two of us, seem to care a lot about this like thing called strategy and and maybe to sort of help make sense of who we are and where we are uh like there are the big three the big strategy consulting firms right and on this two by two of kind of like orthodox ways of teaching and orthodox ways of doing like thinking about strategy Simon and I are both on the unorthodox side of how to think about strategy, um, whereas maybe the big three are more orthodox. Um, and in terms of teaching strategy, I tend to be a little bit more unorthodox, and like maybe Simon has like some some more orthodox ways of like thinking about um, how to teach, in particular his method, Wardley mapping. So like, and just to be like super clear, like um, opposites like that are are not like good and bad, they're just kind of like different dynamics of a continuum and one leads to the other and it's just an interesting kind of way to create a tension. So I lean more towards the unorthodox uh, side of both of these things and so we'll, we'll explore what that means a little bit more. So uh, the, the orthodox sort of approach to worthy mapping, so the standard way of teaching it is to talk about the, the strategy cycle and the strategy cycle is this like five phased loop um, that kind of maps to John Boyd's UDA. Um, I'm not going to go through all the jargon here. You can read a book if you want to learn the jargon, and, and we can talk about it later. But roughly speaking, the idea is you kind of get your head in the game. Like, why do we exist? Why are we doing the things that we do? And then you make a map. You make a model of the world that you're a part of in order to make sense of it. 
Um, and so you have something that talks about the context and, and then you can use that thing, that artifact to have discussions about the things you don't have choice over, the things that you do have choice over, and then the actions that you can take in order to impact the world and change that context actively. And then the loop repeats. So basically it's understanding things and then taking action and seeing what happens and repeating that cycle. In Wardly mapping, there are these things called Wardly maps. And it's basically a diagram that describes the parts of the system, how they relate to each other, and then what makes it a map is that the placement of those parts has meaning. So in particular, what we'll talk about is this idea called evolution. And what we'll describe is how from left to right uh, encodes different ways of meaning in terms of how evolved the things in our organizations, in our markets, and sometimes even in ourselves are and what that implies, uh, what that uh, implies that we should do. But the thing that, that's important to notice is that this whole system adds up to something that produces value for, for humans, for people, for, for users of these systems. So the idea is we anchor our position, our, like we anchor our understanding of the model on the people who we're serving, who we're producing value for. And uh, if you're following along inside Miro, there's this lovely link to a talk by Simon. Um, this is kind of like the, the fully fledged like introduction. If you want the, the full worldly experience, go watch this talk, Crossing the River by Feeling the Stones. And then Simon has also written a free book. So you can go learn about mapping that way. Um, the method is Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike, which means we can all learn it. We can all build on it as long as we give credit where it's due. And I highly encourage you go through that kind of uh, experience of learning mapping. But today, I'm gonna do the unorthodox version of this uh, kind of thing. So let's, let's kind of dig into it. All right. Whenever we're working together, I think that the systems that we're looking at, that we're thinking about, that we're changing, that we're interacting with, in all of our heads, ends up being this big entangled mess. And that creates certain kinds of conditions. I think it creates conditions for misunderstanding, for, for accidental decision making, where you and I might have different versions of what the system actually looks like and the way that it behaves in each of our heads. And so we're, we're actually conflicting implicitly. So like we'll be in a meeting and we'll be talking and we'll be trying to make a decision, and we might even be agreeing, right, about whatever decision it is that we're making. But the words and the, and the concepts, the ontology of the space about which we're making decisions probably conflict, and we probably don't realize it. And so what I think worldly mapping is all about is helping us first take this big mess and try to disentangle it and break it into smaller ideas. So from a big mess to at least some littler messes, some littler ideas that we can then give names to and refer to and make sense of. And, and what happens is we start to recognize how these little ideas are related together so that we understand how an intervention in one little idea has a you know cascading effect on several other little ideas. And if we have this shared language, this shared vocabulary for making sense of a space, then chances are our implicit conflicts will turn into explicit conflicts. We can actually like resolve those differences, not so that we all have the same exact vocabulary and have the same exact meanings in our heads, because like literally we're looking at different parts of the system, but so that we can start to have coherent vocabularies. So like I might have different words, you might have different words, but together, the words add up to something that makes sense as a whole. So there's this weird idea from uh, Chris Argyris, um, and it's discussed in the, the fifth discipline field book by Peter Senge. And it's this idea called the ladder of inf inference. And basically, if you look at the world as a camera would observe it, we cannot literally select enough of reality to make sense of it. So in other words, when I get up in the morning and I, and I look at the world around me, there are certain things that I'm actually just completely ignorant of. Like I'm not paying attention to the ceiling tiles. 
I'm not thinking about the cars that are going by on the highway. It's like the fish in water kind of syndrome. Like I can't see the water around me because it's so like omnipresent that I almost ignore it. And frankly, like if I did literally observe every single thing in the universe at every single moment in time, my head would explode. And so part of being human is selecting data from, excuse me, from all of the observable data and experiences in order to then add meanings to it, make assumptions based on it, draw conclusions and beliefs from it, and then take actions based on those beliefs. And worldly mapping kind of like points at this selecting data part. And it's instead of it happening kind of like automatically, let's, let's do it a little bit manually, a little bit carefully. And um, one of the ways I like to talk about this is by describing uh, the, the romantic and classical modes, which is something that um, I take from Zen and the Art of, Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. It's an interesting book that you know talks about these two ways of appreciating reality. The romantic mode, which is like appreciating the whole of reality, you know, all of the all of the potential data as a whole experience, and then the classical mode, which takes that whole and cuts it into little parts and tries to categorize those parts and sort them and make sense of them and analyze them. And when you do that, though, you kill the romantic notion of the work, the business, the, the things that we're doing every day, our experience. We, we kill the romantic notion, but then we birth something new. It, it, by taking it apart, by analyzing it, by understanding it in all these different ways, we actually create the opportunity for a new understanding, a new romantic appreciation of the whole. And so we create parts and then we create holes and we create parts and we create holes. And it's this back and forth cycle that helps us create new kinds of meaning. Okay, so what does all this have to do with worthy mapping? <laughs> I promise this will make sense in a moment. I like to say that worthy mapping is three basic things. It's a visual way of making sense of systems and how those systems are changing. It's then a body of knowledge, which is evolution, which we'll talk about here about how, like a specific body of knowledge about how those systems are changing inside capitalism in particular. And then third, it's a strategic thinking framework, um, which we'll, we'll talk about in a moment, that leverages those visual approaches and leverages those ways of understanding how capitalism is changing our everyday life. So evolution is this thing that Simon went and researched. He basically studied a bunch of publications, learned how people talk about things, and with thousands of data points, basically put together these basic patterns. And the basic patterns are, hey, everything evolves under supply and demand competition. And as they evolve, we can kind of identify specific stages of that evolution. And depending on what the thing is that we're considering, so activities are like what we do, practices are how we do it, and so on, depending on which stage those things are, are in, we can give them different labels that sort of match those stages. So for example, practices are really like interesting because when they first exist, they're novel, like nobody's ever seen them. And we don't even know if they're valuable. But as they start to have known value, they, they sort of shift into this emerging stage, stage two, where like we don't quite have them fully formed, but we're starting to kind of understand the value and like we're able to reproduce the value in like custom ways in each context that we try to try to use it. And then over time, it becomes repeatable value becomes a good practice, right? And if it survives long enough and it becomes ubiquitous, then it can turn into a best practice. And so ba the basic assertion is that everything is evolving in these ways. And so if that's true, then the characteristics of those things are changing as they evolve. And like, <laughs> I love this table because it is so overwhelming. Like I, want, I look at it and want to have a, a panic attack but like, <laughs> I have to slow down, right? And I have to actually like see what's what's happening here. So like, we can zoom in, right? Okay, there's some familiar things from the last slide. We got stage one, two, three, and four. Okay, activities, data, practice, knowledge. That was something we just talked about. Okay, what are these things along the left-hand side? Okay, these are characteristics. Interesting, ubiquity, certainty, the market, user perception. And I see how in each stage, I have different things that I can read to learn about how those characteristics are occurring. I think my favorite personally is this one right here, failure. In stage one, failure is assumed, like it's gonna happen. But in stage four, it's exactly the opposite. We're surprised by failure and like everything is about efficiency and efficacy. So like things shouldn't fail. 
And so I can think about the things in my life that I encounter every day, like power, the fact that there's a wall outlet with electricity. I kind of view this as a stage four thing because like failure is surprising. It's widespread. It's commonly under understood in terms of use. So I can try on these descriptions of the characteristics of the thing to see where power fits. And right now it feels like it's a stage four thing. It's a commodity and, or really probably a utility. Okay. But I can also think about worthy mapping itself, right? I think that worthy mapping feels more like a stage two activity. It's, it's like the domain of experts and we're trying to change that, right? We're trying to make it more accessible by having calls like this and by sharing with everyone. And there are lots of different ways of thinking about like how it can fail and how it's a found value and how we're, we're constantly trying to make it better and how it's got this, you know, potential for future like awesomeness. And so that's kind of like the basic idea of evolution, but like, okay, bunch of words, bunch of theory. I'm going to need Diane's help to make this real. <laughs> All right. So, so Diane, I asked you if you could think about something like a context that matters to you. And I was kind of wondering if like we could do like a quick, really, really high level map of a space. And so like, w what did you think of when I asked you like a, of, of a context that matters to you? Like what kind of context would you like to talk about? Well, this is actually a good a good question because this is um, what I, I mean, I watched a bunch of Simon stuff and a few of your things over the past couple of days to get ready for this. And what I was trying to figure out was what are good things to map? Right? <laughs> so, yeah. And, and let me explain what I mean. It's like, so I work in different open source communities, um, the OpenShift world um, and OKD is the open source side of that. And we've just done a GA release of that. And for one of the things that I was trying to tease out is um, this idea of usually when Simon's talking about this, he needs an anchor, right? So for me, the anchor is the community or the customers that are in the community. Um, so who is the anchor for us? And so the anchor, trying to determine that, so teasing that out is that um, the anchor, you would, in a production world, you'd say those are the customers, um, or I would say for in our world, it is the end users of, of the of OKD or of Kubernetes or OpenShift or what it is, whatever it is. So figuring out who is the anchor here, because um, one of the things that gets confused in community development a lot are um, the end users versus the contributors, people who are the engineers and the documentation people and the trainers and all of the contributors to the community. Um, and then there's another whole level on top of that, which are um, the people who build things that run on it. So integrate integrators, people um, who add things, um, which we would call partners that maybe create an operator that runs and adds a service to OKD. So there's, you know, there's a whole lot of people. So um, maybe the thing to map here is trying to, and I'm not sure this is a great thing to map, but um, it's what I'm going for. And maybe we'll tease out what the problem is from that. Um, the operators of clouds. So Google would be um, someone, um, Azure, you know, th those, those communities of people too. So there's partners, cloud hosts, and all of those kind of people. So awesome. <laughs> So that sounds like a, a wonderful place to start. Like we we like that's really one of the first questions most of the time in mapping right, is like, who are we who who are we serving or who are we, who are we, who are we most concerned about right now that we want to understand their needs the most or understand the system that fulfills their needs the most? So would you like to do the operators? Is that right? Yeah, and I I think that's I think the operators are easy. In my humble opinion, they're um, they're like they're Google, they're Azure, they're um, AWS, they're um, IBM Cloud, they're um, and then there are people who um, and then there are all there's another whole category of people who are running on prem kind of too. So, but it's it's kind of where it's also the answer to the question where are end users using our thing? Uh, in this case, OKD or OpenShift, right? So they're using it on-prem as well as on bare metal and stuff like that. But um, there are some of the cloud operators are people who are in our community that we have to engage with. Um, so that's one one thing to tease out. Um, <laughs> the other thing is 
most of those operators are not currently contributing in a real way back to the project. We just, we just need them involved so that when we want to go and test on their thing, we need a connection to them. So we need a mm. point of contact. So we kind of do need in the community, we need at least one from every one of those areas so that we can test and make sure yeah. that all stuff runs on there. So we always need okay. a point of contact there. Yeah, so so let's start let's start with like a, a really high level version of this. And like my goal is gonna be in the next couple minutes for us to make a map with like only five parts. And like this is totally ridiculous, right? But but it's to prove a point that like you can always go deeper. And like the something I was thinking about this morning is like the there's like a really problematic way to start, which is like you go too wide and you get too detailed and you get overwhelmed and then you stop. Okay. Right. And, I'm gonna, and, and language is also a really important thing. So I'm going to stop because right now, by calling that operators, um, we're confusing it with another area, which is another bunch of participants. So I would call that cloud host instead of operators. Nice. Okay, great. We've, we've made our first, like, we, we just had a just moment right there. Yeah, we, we I, had, I caught that, yeah. You said cloud hosting providers? Yeah, cloud host. Just you can just host for short. Awesome. Okay, cool. Excellent. So yeah, like we just had this awesome moment where we we actually got to uh, like create a shared language where we're like, are we going to call them operators? No, we're going to call them cloud hosts because that reduces the ambiguity. So like yep. we could have made a ton of decisions without like without knowing that this was an important sort of bit of terminology to adjust. So so let's let's think about the cloud hosts and like let's make a just a quick list of like Five, like a couple, maybe five things that cloud hosts get value from. What are what are things that that are cons like of concern to us, as in we 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 want to pay attention to them but that produce is, value for is, cloud hosts? I think this is my interpretation of what cloud hosts think are important. Excellent. Um, I mean, that's the um, point. <laughs> that's, that's, and the cloud hosts might have another idea. So, what cloud hosts want end users to do is consume their resources. Okay. okay. So they want people to deploy stuff on their clouds that cause, you know, creates revenue for them, you know, resource consumption. Is that, so, is that a good phrase for that, do you think? Yeah, I think so, yeah, because they make, okay. that's where they make their revenue from. Um, and so okay. cool. OKD or OpenShift or Kubernetes or running Kubernetes on a cloud host um, or a, that um, gives people gives end users reasons to use a cloud host. Hmm. If I'm thinking in the way, I mean, so that's, so that would um, be yeah. one of them. Um, so what, what would you call like the things like OKD, OpenShift, et cetera? Like the, the reason to use the cloud, what, is there a word we can maybe make up for um, that? I'm gonna make up a word and someone can correct me later. Um, <laughs> yep. Maybe service enablement, you know, it's the thing we are, we are, we enable people to more easily consume their resources. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to get a little above like the technical thing. That no, yeah, this is perfect. And, and like part of the fun, like one of the exercises I, I always do when I, I run workshops is like, I, I try to get people to like take things apart. And like, it's amazing. Like I'll, I'll say, take apart a pen. And they'll, it's amazing how many different ways people slice it, which, things they call which parts and like people always make up names for things and like that's a critical skill here. So service enablement seems like a, a solid first pass, right? At, at what is probably a very complex set of things that are happening, but like we can always come back and make it better. So resource consumption is happening. Service enablement is happening. Uh, what else is happening that's like coming together, part of the system that's coming together to create value for cloud hosts? So I, I think the other thing is then they can upsell them other services. So if you think of like um, Google Cloud has uh, a lot of additional, you know, data, different specific data storages that they think are better than like the generic ones that come with, um, you know, mm -hmm. other things. So they they will upsell their other sort other services. Okay. You know? so yeah, and, they, and the more people we bring to their cloud, we bring people who love OpenShift to their cloud, then the more people um, and you know that um, that will buy their other services. Yeah, and, and the upselling, like 
I kind of have like so resource consumption. I'm thinking like, okay, someone's getting API keys and they're like spinning up instances of things, and service enablement is like, okay, th they have a particular use case, like they they want to run OpenShift or they want to run like uh, Kubernetes or whatever, like, and then upselling though, like, what does that work look like? Is that like salespeople on calls mm -hmm. or? You know, that, that's, that's, I think, you know, where it would be lovely to have like five other people here doing this with me because I think, I think of it as, um, so every cloud host in my mind has um, a value add. It's hmm. something they think about as special as them. Maybe it's, um, they have more regions than, um, you know, like, the, you know, AWS has, has uh, server farms, you know, all over the world. Um, but maybe someone has one that's specifically tuned for machine learning and AI. Okay. So that that's where I think is that then you know whatever their special sauce is, they um, okay. they, they can sense. sell that special sauce. Yeah, and, and like what I'm doing right now is kind of I'm prioritizing capturing the words that are coming out of out of your head. In order to that like it, one of the the ways people get stuck with wordly mapping is like am I am I writing down the right thing? Yeah. And the answer is, don't worry about it. <laughs> don't worry about it yet. Um, yeah. Because like the important thing is to capture a handle, so a word or, set of, or a phrase that like captures an entry point to a whole phenomena or a whole phenomenon that like you can then go talk about more and you can refine it and, and like make it more clear and more specific and get it into the wordly frame or whatever. But just get the words onto paper. Okay, like, let's, let's find one more thing. So we got resource consumption, we've got service enablement, we've got upselling and then we've got like the, the value add that is being upsold so so what is one more thing that we can put in the system that is producing value for cloud hosts brand awareness to our our end users you know so i mean mm. i'm just doing because there's this interesting dynamic because i'm coming in my headset's always community development right mm -hmm. So yep. what I want is to make the cloud hosts feel like they should contribute to um, the, the community. They should not just contribute, but they should participate in the community. Um, and and the, the, the reason for that is that people will use their services. Um, mm -hmm. And what I need from them is to make sure that the people who are contributors and testers on, in, in our community have access to the right images on their cloud hosts, that you know, if it's OKD, you know the Fedora Chorus images are there to be more technical, or if it's OpenShift, then the mm -hmm. RHEL images are there. Like all the right bits and pieces are. So there's mm -hmm. things that we need um, from whether it's product or community. We need the cloud hosts to do with us, um, that, and we can, we, we can do the same exercise with you know with the contributors. We need them most. A lot of the contributors come from our end users. Um, and so we need to make sure that the features and other pieces of the world that they're they're living in, you know, are there. So the prerequisites, I think, is a is a good thing there. Is that the prerequisites. Okay, is that is that a good word for that? Yeah, I think. Yeah. Okay. Pre prerequisites is, for running the the yeah. Prerequisites for is it for the service enablement stuff? Yeah. Um, and like, what we've just done is we've created a basic ontology. So like an ontology is like, what are the things and what are the like relationships between the things? And like, we, we've talked about relationships and what we're gonna do on this call is we're gonna make something called like a minimum, called a minimum viable worthy map. And, so, and the difference between a minimum so viable worthy pause, map. Pause you just for a second, because Barbara yeah, actually ahead. put in a really good one in, in the chat here that's scaling. Ooh. Um, and, and maybe that's a subtopic under resource consumption, but skip, throw that in there for a minute now. Yeah. Awesome, scaling is on the board, excellent. Yeah, so like the, the difference between a minimum viable worthy map and a conventional worthy map is like we're actually just trying to get our draft to zero on the board, right? So and we, knowing that we can always make it better, one of the things that can get like newbies really stuck when it comes to worthy mapping is trying to fiddle with the, all the relationships. And, and so one of, one of the things you can do just as a cheat to sort of get through the process once and then so you can make it better later is to forego defining relationships. Now in worldly mapping, relationships are about dependency. So what depends on what else? So you could argue that cloud hosts depend on 
upselling, right? They want revenue. And the way that upselling exists is through like service enablement. So fulfilling value for customers. And then service enablement depends on things like scaling or resource service enablement depends on resource consumption. You could draw a bunch of dependency, like sort of relationships between these parts. And like, that's super valuable. You should definitely do that. In fact, knowing those dependencies can make you uh, aware of certain strategic options that are available. But for now, we just want to get through draft zero. So what, what I want to point at too is that each one of these things that we've listed could be a whole set of maps unto themselves. So we can, we can make a whole set of maps around end user brand awareness. Like we could talk about content writing, we could talk about Twitter, we could talk about just like Google, like SEO for, for like different kinds of support topics. We could talk about support and customer service and things like that. Like there's so many different activities that could fit underneath here. We could talk about having folks attend Transformation Fridays, hey? <laughs> we could, and, and talk it with, with you. And like, there's so many things that could fit inside here that could be their own map, right? Or we could zoom all the way out and make a map where all this stuff fits under one as one component. Like it's just one thing on somebody else's big map. So I just want to point at that. So now let's talk a little bit about this this messy thing called evolution. So I'm gonna like I'm gonna copy all these things over to this part of the map over here. Uh, so we got our cloud hosts, our users at the top of our minimum viable Wardly map, and I'm gonna just like put everything in stage one for now because we don't know where everything belongs yet. So I'm just gonna make a mess here. So so here's the question: We just want to make sense of the space at first. So how do we decide how evolved everything is? And the answer is we use cheat sheets. Uh, so if we if we scroll up, I tried to keep things pretty like easy to find. And we're gonna there's there are two ways to go about like putting things along the evolutionary axis in worldly mapping. And, and one way is like really deep and really uh, slow, and the other way is like let's just get it on the board and see what happens. So we're gonna do that way <laughs> to get it on the board and see what happens. And so Diane, if you can go up here and reference this table right here, the, mm -hmm. the everything evolves under supply and demand competition, mm -hmm. and just think about these labels. So Genesis, custom, product, commodity, novel, emerging, good, and best. Just try these on for each of these stickies mm -hmm. and take like a guess, a, just okay. a first gut feeling guess about which stage it's in. We can always go read and do research to like confirm our assumptions here, but we're just trying to get the parts on the board. So uh, I'm gonna count down to five in my head for each of these things. And like, you're just gonna tell me a number. Does that sound good? <laughs> All right, let's, um, let's, let's start at, uh, yeah. So the value add is probably still in the Genesis side or it may be Genesis. Um, All right, I'm gonna change the color to note that we've, we've placed it in Genesis. All right, end user brand awareness, one, two, three, or four. Um, that is maybe two. Scaling. Scaling um, is probably three. It's big prob you probably once once it's installed and everything, I would think maybe three. And okay, awesome. Down. So again, just for everyone following along, we're just like trying on these labels to see what fits. Mm -hmm. And so if you're in the in the Miro, you can sort of follow along um, and see see what all that's about. So okay, all right. Prerequisites for service enablement. So kind of fits along with the service enablement thing. Just take a thing. That I think is one of the harder things to figure out. Mm. Um, and go back up to your top for a minute so I see the categories again here. Yeah, let's look at this. That's it. So it's um, a Genesis custom. I'm fe I feel like Trump, you know, person, woman, man, whatever the thing was he screwed up the other day um, on his test, cognitive test. Go back down again. So I think it, it probably is. Um, is this a cobra or is it a bear? I'm I, sorry. I think it's a two. I think it's an elephant. Um, uh, I think, oh, right. I think, I think, I think and, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna prerequisite, pre think this is for OKD. This is not for OpenShift. So anyone who's okay, listening good. to this later, uh, OpenShift is probably in the product side. So I'm gonna talk about, use this and, and not offend anyone in sales or marketing anywhere. Um, no, it's perfect. We're, we're just like refining which assumptions we're putting on the board and like we can have a talk, we can have a conversation with everyone about it later about how it's wrong. But like for now, <laughs> we're just getting draft zero on the board, right? 
And, so, and, and service enablement, I would put again in, in two. And again, great. everybody said so no one screams at me later. This is about OKD4, which if you go to OKD.io, you will find out that it was just released, you know, two weeks ago um, for GA use. So that, uh -huh. that's why this is, is this there. So I have to say this, otherwise someone somewhere will come back and go, all right. Well, have them make a map, and then we can we can we can have a discussion. That's it'll be great. <laughs> and, and so I think right. um, upselling, um, I would say, the relationships aren't built quite yet for um, no for upselling OKD. There's not enough awareness at any of the cloud mm. hosts of OKD itself. So let's just okay. say that. so. That's I would say that's still in genesis. We're still doing outreach to all of them. The Fedora Core OS community yep. is doing okay. all of good stuff. Resource consumption. We, um, this is, this is a tough one because, and I would say this is still, a, this is a two. We're not, nothing here mm. is a utility yet, yet. Maybe, okay. in another, maybe in another month it would be, but we need all of these other things to happen. The resource consumption, it is a utility. This is where we, I'll, maybe I'll bounce this off you. At the cloud host, um, their resources are utilities pretty much now, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So, we just make need to make sure that um, that our stuff runs on their utility. So mm -hmm. resources at the cloud hosts are pretty much AWS, Google Cloud, um, Azure. All those things are utilities. It's us, the OKD stuff, that's still flushing out how to make itself useful and available in all of these places and known, which is the end user mm -hmm. awareness stuff. You know. I don't think end Whoa. users really know that yet. So I, I would guess for cloud host right now, this might be the state of the union for um, there. And upselling is um, a real difficult topic because mm -hmm. OKD is the free open source version of OpenShift. And so there, um, there's a conflict there that we would mm. have to tease out of, you know, we at Red Hat really want people to use the product version. So um, there's some conflicts here with um, what um, product versus the open source version. And awesome. So I just like threw a comment on there because that's like that's like a whole conversation we could have. Mm -hmm. And what's funny is like I know basically nothing about this space, right? Mm -hmm. I think I'm a, I used to be a systems administrator, um, but I have not uh, Kubernetes anything so, <laughs> uh, other than like local Docker stuff sometimes. But like. I, I know basically nothing, but you and I just created a vocabulary and we, we, we put our assumptions on the board and we defined like at least two conversations that need to happen right now. One is, okay, what is with this gap between the way that OKD is treating resource consumption and the way that resource consumption is expected in terms of the cloud hosts? Yeah. And then second, you're like, there's this conflict here, right? We like th There are ways that open source can make a ton of sense as a way that enables product sort of plays, but like right now it's just a conflict. And so like, w we don't wanna be in a situation where it's like the community versus the like the sales part of this, right? So like, we should figure that out, right? So we could have a conversation about that. And that's that's the whole point. So so first I'll mention, for, for those of you who have done more of the mapping before, you're probably confused about like what's going on with the Y axis here. And uh, what I'll say is like, First of all, in, in this minimum viable map, the y-axis has no meaning. We're, we're not doing, we're just doing a basic sorting where left, right has meaning, but not up, down. The second thing is the y-axis is a lie, and if you uh, see me after class. <laughs> so we'll talk about that. But like, um, what we've so I'm done. Gonna say is, one, one word about the upselling. The reason, yeah. the, the, the way that I mostly resolve it is, is that the open source side of, OK, of OpenShift, which is OKD, is the pipeline for product fails. So once people get used to it, they're running it on an open source and they want support, they want all of the other value add speech things, the way that I, as a community person, hopefully make the account managers and salespeople happy is that by people using OKD, they learn about the need for support um, and all of the other value add things that it become. So that's, mm. and so it's, it is we position community in some ways as the pipeline for sales. And I'm yeah, that's a really awesome point because it also makes me think about this brand awareness and community 
participation thing, which I, I think you were you when we first wrote this, we were talking about cloud hosts, mm -hmm. but it makes me think of a whole other set of things, which is how how do you make sure that when someone downloads the open source project, they become immediately aware that if they need help, they can go get it. And like it, that that's a whole brand awareness thing of its own, I think as well. So like we, having these conversations is like the whole point of making the maps. Yeah. So that we can actually come together and have a shared intent about each of these parts. Like most of the time, like the orthodox version of strategy at large is like an executive somewhere makes a decision and like hopefully it's the right one. And it may or may not be validated by like the, the reality that we're we're a part of. Like mm -hmm. maybe it's just gut feeling. Maybe it's just like heuristics that have worked for them in the past. But this is more analytical and it's a model enabled analytical way of approaching strategy. Yeah. And this, if we create these artifacts, we create conditions for good conversations. And the longer I look at this, the more I want to tweak it. So we should move on. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, that's how you know that we've succeeded, right? So yeah. what, what I'll say is like, we've already identified like two or three opportunities here to go explore, but there are a whole bunch more we could we could ex like really dig into. So for, for those of you who know about worthy mapping, there's uh, three buckets of things. So climatic patterns, which is like the, the things we don't get choice over. Doctrinal principles, which is the, the the things that we choose that we believe are universally appropriate, uh, and so it's things like think small or uh, maybe maybe don't build everything when there are things uh, that we can buy instead that that would help us focus more on our unique value props. So like, and and then there's this last thing called leadership, which is about gameplay moves. And so what I've done here is like in this board, like there's just this little like table full of seven things it's just kind of a, a mishmash of, of some of those and you can go down and read more about them here but if you did if you hadn't found opportunities already uh discussions to have actions to take etc by going through the map and just having discussions around it you could then go through each item in the map and prompt it with these kinds of questions like for example like are we treating this part of our map differently than the rest of the world and if so is that good or bad is that a valuable thing for us to do or is it a waste like, is, are we are we actually benefiting by by uniquely paying attention to this in this way, or should we just buy it, or, or should we just outsource it, or should we just adopt it, right? And so it's like those kind of hard conversations that need to happen explicitly instead of uh, either happening accidentally or implicitly. So that's my little rant about strategy. Now the reason I think Diane that you wanted me to talk about worthy mapping at all was so that we can make sense of a technological ecosystem and. So I, I want to make sure that we have time to talk about that. I also want to make sure that we have time to sort of get any questions sort of answered if there are any. Um, doesn't look like there are. So if you haven't joined the Miro board already, you can go to lwm.events slash OSC, and you can go explore here and, and play, lwm.events slash OSC. And la late last night, <laughs> I oh, wrote. Oh no, you didn't try. <laughs> so, so let me let me um, set the stage of why I asked. Yeah. Um, and if you zoom in on that diagram there that you're trying to do, uh, and so if anyone hasn't looked at the landscape diagram for um, the CNCF, which is the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, which is what Kubernetes and OpenShift and Red Hat as you know are participants in this landscape. And um, there's different ways to view this. This is an interactive site. Um, you can go to landscape.cncf.io. Um, you can see it. And, and um, yeah, so, and so that's kind of, you know, that's the world that I live in as a community development person. And pretty much every one of those um, squares on that thing is another open source community or um, something related to that. So it's crazy. Um, and, logos. <laughs> and if, if I take you back a step to OKD, um, if you find, I don't even know if you can find, yeah, you can see the little tiny Kubernetes thing there on, you know, go back to your landscape sc screen in there. There's a one Kubernetes thing which looks sort of like the blue hub cappy thing on the corner. Kubernetes has about 80 distributions of it right now. So 80 different um, organizations that are putting out distributions of just that one open source project of which OpenShift is a productized version, of which OKD is the open source side of that productized version. Mm. So you get to see the crazy ass world that um, <laughs> we're all living in and try and and Kubernetes has dependencies on Helm and I'm trying to pick the ones that you can and, and you know 
using service mesh and, and all these projects and Linkerd, they all have interdependencies. And so as a community development person um, on the outside, not sitting on the CNCF TOC, just making sense of this and all the relationships is basically my job. Um, mm. And making sure that if there's a feature I need for OKD, um, that Fedora, and if Fedora is not even on this map, it's just crazy mm. ads. <laughs> One of the problems about this, um, or not the problems, things that things like technical oversight committees have to decide is who gets added into this diagram. Mm, so, yeah. um, and we have a, a wonderful process. It works pretty good of um, incubated, graduated, and sandbox projects. And okay. you can propose a project to be a sandbox one, and then it can move from sandbox to incubated, and then it gets a little more resources and a little more love from the CNCF, and then graduated means it's mature and it's got a good community around it and a healthy um, user base. And mm. there's probably more things, and I'm skimming fast here. But deciding <laughs> which thing it should be added, which thing should be graduated and incubated is a real big problem. Mm. Um, and then as a Canadian, I have to put in one more metaphor is, um, where is the hockey puck going? Like when, when is something um, new coming into this thing that's gonna disrupt it, um, that we should be aware of? Where are the disruptors, the new things, and when things need to be, um, I, should I say it, retired, right? There's no longer a need for it, something new has come out. So is there a, a possibility of retiring something from this? So there's lots of things that, um, that we, and so, and there's so many things in here, it's hard to figure out what to pay attention to. Mm, yeah. That's, that, oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, by, by the nature of it being an ecosystem, it basically means that it's so big that there, and there are so many, like, individual parts that, like, are all coming together to create these emerging, like, behaviors of, like, what partnerships are occurring, what integrations are happening, which startups are like existing all of a sudden and, and which ones are not existing all of a sudden. And it's like, how do you keep track of it all? And the answer is like, no one person can actually keep all of this in their head. Yeah. And so the, the value I would say of, of making a, like a model of this like this is, is to at least know what the parts are <laughs> to it, to at least know uh, what the degrees of freedom are in this big, messy, like emergent entangled thing. And why I would consider paying attention to, like, using a model, in particular, like, a Wardley mapping model, is, is the evolution part of this. Um, the evolution part of this and the anticipation part of this. So, so evolution is fun because it tells you, or at least gives you the opportunity to sort of, like, guess what the characteristics of each of these little logos are. And if you really want to understand each of the logos, you can you can dig in. You can go read the press releases. You can, and in fact, like part of what I, I, I explored in this article is like my basic process for trying to make sense of an ecosystem, and, and it has a lot to do with like similarly to how we were just trying to get words on the page. Like for the most part, I'm trying to see what words are already exist about these things. Mm -hmm. And so one of the kind of breakthroughs that I had when I was going through the the giant like landscape was there are categories of things there, there are, there are, hi there's a hierarchy mm -hmm. and like some, like I, there was like app develop app definition and development, for example, or, um, or a, a monitoring and observability or something, something like that. Right. So I was trying to like figure out what the parts were. And what I ended up realizing is that the categories weren't like the right ontology for me to use to make sense of things. I had to go one layer deeper and actually blow out the detail. And so like, that's what, that's why I ended up with this. But even this might be the wrong way to go about it because it's, it's, it's almost like too much to deal with all at once. And so the, the way that I like highly recommend approaching an ecosystem question is to like know what the big high level boxes are, but then like piece by piece, explore each thing and learn about it. And just like, what, what are the words that people are using? Um, and and I, I've been doing some work with like John Cutler re recently, and he's taught me a lot of like really useful methods for exploring a space, like like just doing an image search, or or what diagrams people are making about like service mesh, <laughs> or or cloud native network, and then like you, you start to see all the models that people have made, mm -hmm. and all the all the words that they're using to describe those things, 
And when when you get though like a, a space like this, when you get a couple of those things on a map, suddenly you're like you find that you're asserting certain things about the the qualities that they have. So if, if I say that like monitoring is stage four, mm -hmm. then I'm asserting that it's an established thing yep. in the ecosystem that like it's ubiquitous. Like that's what that's what a stage four thing is. It's ubiquitous. Yeah. So but, I would say the projects around that uh, monitoring, and this is again everybody who's listening, Diane's opinion, Prometheus, Grafana, those are pretty stable, mature, and and that those would be the things that I would think would be graduated mm -hmm. projects. So you can mm -hmm. actually filter on that landscape diagram and pick all those graduated things, and those. For the most part, maybe I wouldn't say they were utilities yet, but they would at the very least be in stage three, you know. Yeah. And some of them would be in stage from this yeah. direction. Yeah, somewhere there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we can, and people would debate me with this on different things. And then, so the things that are interesting to me um, are, you know, in terms of the hockey puck conversation, what is the mm -hmm. disruptor? What are the new things that have just come in? Like the yeah. operator fr operator framework um, is new, and so that's. A new thing here, the operator framework is very new. It's um, and the operator pattern um, is, be is is on the cusp of becoming, um, yeah, somewhere over there. But so the, so that's you know, that's almost an exercise that I, I'd love to do with a bunch of people from the CNCF um, and or just interested parties. Um, you know where are, are you know arguably maybe operator framework now is being incubated. So maybe incubated is stage two. You know, and the operator pattern is probably somewhere between two and three, right? So, and these, and Kubernetes hopefully is at least, at least to, um, I would say Kubernetes itself is probably in four. It's, you know, it's probably in four right now. It's a utility, it's available on a, pretty much every cloud hosting provider has some flavor of it now. Mm. Um, Everybody know. wants a cube. <laughs> yeah, every, and everybody can have a cube, and there are 80 different cubes. So, you get a cube, um, and you get a cube. <laughs> yeah, and, and pick your cube. Um, and, you know, and, yeah. And, what will happen if you have those conversations is the conversation will, there will be conflict, actually. <laughs> like, that's, oh, that's the only oh, guarantee. Yeah. Opinionated is part yep. of the, is one of the words, if you Google this cloud native, opinionated is what, you know, <laughs> Opinionated versions of cloud, you know, anything. Yeah, they're yep. very opinionated. And one of the the values of of having an artifact to look at, like e even even this, right? Like so, like having a bunch of logos to look at at least lets us agree on what the things are. Mm -hmm. And when we start to add something like worthy mapping, where position has meaning, where like the left rightness actually like means something, and yeah. like it says a lot about our assumptions about it. What will, what will start to happen is like we'll have conflicts over like, hey, I think it's in stage one. No, it's in stage four. What are you talking about? And like that's that's the whole point is we can we can argue about the artifact. Like I don't have to attack you. <laughs> I don't have to say Diane, your ideas are bad. Like no, like each of us has this like awesome expertise, and it's the value of all of our perspectives in the room collaborating on this artifact to like get our assumptions on the table and to actually have nuanced discussions about the thing. In order to like have productive conflict as opposed to like problematic conflict, we we can come together and actually like start to make decisions about what what we think the world is like. And one of the big things that will come out of this is you'll have to start breaking these things down. Like you know, if if there's a conflict over something, you'll have to recognize that okay, operator framework, this is like a specific instance of a broader thing. Mm -hmm. And and what is that broader thing made of? Mm -hmm. And like then you'll start to realize that that broader thing has components in Genesis in stage one and components in commodity in stage four. And like there's a disposition across the entire evolutionary spectrum that all adds up to like some position maybe, but like we can't have a nuanced discussion about it until we actually know what those parts are and then recognize that, oh, this is, it's messy under here. <laughs> and actually that's okay. Yeah, it is, it is really messy under here, and and then that's you know, and I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with the landscape diagram other than it irritates the crap of, out of me on a daily basis trying to find <laughs> stuff on it. But if you learn to use the filters, it's really great. Um, filters are great, yeah. And 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 people have forked it and done. What, there's a uh, there's a a landscape diagram for um, Open Data Hub, which is you know hmm. they've used the same metaphor and everything. But one of the things I I think that's 
that's interesting to me. Um, and and if you can go over, we can go over the hour if you totally. have time. So yeah, I'm hanging out. This this whole landscape metaphor is, is something. It is it is a mature thing. Um, yeah, it's something that can be reused, right? Like once it once it exists, you're like, oh, a landscape is an idea. We can we can make our own and build new value on top of it. Like yeah. So that there's lo lots of aspects to this and like someone's going to say, well, why didn't you put Helm in the maturity, you know, in the four? And I would put Helm um, over by K, um, uh, by Kubernetes as another thing um, that's coming. So Helm, just to make all the Helm people happy. But then I would like to talk about what happens just quickly here when something goes from being um, a utility to being a past tense and this is not a, a mm. slide on, on helm or anything but when something um is no longer part of the ecosystem like one of the yep. things that i'm always like i do two things as a community development person i have another whole conversation that we should have about um uh i use network analysis of who's contributing to which projects um to see i have this wonderful diagram it looks like a jelly a whole bunch of jellyfish and each of the jellyfish have tentacles that are attached to each other. So like when someone's working in operator framework and they're also working in um, Kubernetes and they're also working in Helm, all of those three jellyfish at least have one tentacle attaching to each other. And I can watch with these diagrams how people migrate from one project to another. Mm. So it's almost like the engineers and the participants in the communities are telling me when they're leaving a technology and going to a new one, right? Um, and this is this is key for um, a lot of things. It's like then we need to, if it is like maybe it's etcd or or some and it's not. So nobody worry about these things. I keep saying this and wave my hand. Um, we need to make sure that engineer it, and it's a linchpin for our our whole ecosystem. It has to stay stable. But all the engineers are migrating away from it. We have mm -hmm. to look at that and make sure we pay people to stay working on it, right? Yeah. So it's, you know, sort of like Linux or something like that. You need to make, have a stable of engineers who are always making sure that it's secure and growing, even though it may not be, and someone will slide me for this, the sexy thing of the week. It's not Kubernetes. Everybody wants to work on Kubernetes, right? So, you know, though that's what the network diagram does for me. It shows me when projects are being abandoned or when engineers are putting their focus on server, serverless or Knative or something else. Mm -hmm. Um, so, yeah, somebody just gave a good pioneers conversation. Um, <laughs> yeah, pioneers giving way to settlers. That's a very good way of putting it. And we have to make sure that settlers stay in that project. Um, so, so that's, yeah. so how do we represent or how, or can Wardly mapping help us um, see that happening? Um, yeah, the, Wardly mapping is, so it, it kind of like goes one way, right? And, and the implication of things going one way or evolving from left to right is things either become invisible because they just become so baked in that um, we just stop noticing them mm -hmm. or they, they disappear because they don't exist anymore. Yeah. And um, I think it's useful to differentiate between instances of a thing disappearing and the broader concept itself. Mm -hmm. um, so compute uh, is, a, is a classic example that, that Simon Wardley talks about. It's like compute as what? The first computers that were invented in, in Germany or whatever? Like, okay, that's an, th those computers were the instance, like maybe an abacus was a computer at some, like in, in one frame of it, right? Not many people are using abacuses, abaci, I don't know, to, to do compu computation right now. And instead we've got serverless. So like there's there's an evolution and a, a sort of like the general concept continues if it's a useful broad concept, but the specific instances might go away. And so it's it's useful to kind of like pay attention to that dynamic. But then the other thing to notice is that in general, if something is shifting from stage three into stage four, the implication is that there's going to be a giant death event. Um, and, and what I mean by that is when you shift from stage three, where there basically the, the nature of the way stage three behaves is there's a lot of money to be made. Mm -hmm. There's a, like you, there, the way that like where custom is like, 
okay, you have to custom implement a thing everywhere. And so there's a lot of money to be made because of that, because everyone wants one and they can't get one. So you have to custom build it. In stage three, it's you, you're starting to operationalize the production of the thing. You're starting to like re repeatedly manufacture the same form of value and, and be able to deploy that repeatedly. And so everybody wants one. And so everyone can get one because they can buy one. So the only way to differentiate yourself is with features or with like, you know, different different implementation styles or, or what customizations or what have you. And then what happens is over time, the value of that differentiate, like eventually there are, there are enough features. <laughs> We've got enough features. We don't need any more features. Um, and, and the actual, like, the only thing we can compete on anymore is cost. Mm -hmm. And that's when the race to the bottom begins. Yeah. And what you start to see is when things tip over into stage four, the end state is going to be a couple players. Like there's no longer going to be hundreds of people producing these things or hundred, hundreds of organizations. There's, there's going to be three or two. And um, to the extent that it's possible, they will try to keep themselves from having to compete on price. But the nature of stage four is that you have to be operating at scale, which means that your pricing has to be low and at volume and, and like, all these requirements for efficiency and pretty soon the only people who can afford to play in that space are the ones who can afford to make it so efficient and to operate things at such scale mm -hmm. that um th they can get away with that pricing so th there's there's like that that moment when you realize that there's a consolidation event yeah. um and so to the extent you can be sensitized to that like it'll it'll help you anticipate when that's starting to happen. And I love how you're talking about sensing this by paying attention to engineer project migration. It reminds me so much of like uh there was there's a practice of like how do you know if, if companies are doing mergers and acquisitions in like the eighties and nineties? You pay attention to flight numbers and which executives are getting on of who and which private jets are going to which cities at which times. Like Ooh. and that like you just mine that information and pay attention to it. And eventually you start to go, oh, these two companies are talking to each other a lot. I wonder why that is. And it's not because you come away with like, they're going to merge. It's like something is happening here and we need to pay attention to it. Yeah. That's the difference. It's interesting because this, this, the network analysis tool that, that I use, I didn't use it to sense migration. I was looking for connections. Like, mm. so if I had someone who was working on, um, it started with open tracing and Zipkin and Jaeger, I was looking for using the tool to see who from Red Hat was participating in a community. <laughs> and then I was trying to sense, uh, I would need a speaker who knew, uh, for a community event, who knew um, both Zipkin and Jaeger and open tracing and, you know, trying to get a feel for who was in the community. And that triggered oh, I can see um, some migration from the Zipkin community to Jaeger, and oh, look at this guy, Yuri, who's at Uber, and this was all pre-CNCF um, donation by Uber of Jaeger to the CNCF as a project. So it's like, and that little epiphany of like looking at, looking for somebody showed me where people were moving around in these things and the usefulness of this to understand um, the emerging new projects, maturing project and pro projects where the pioneers were leaving and the settlers. Um, we needed to make sure that there were some settlers. <laughs> and I, I love that you pointed that out. That's yeah. so cool because it, you, you, you articulated exactly like the whole point of like strategy is like to build assets, right? Like, oh, I mean, maybe that's the whole point, but like assets have such a key role to play by investing in something like contribution network analysis and pushing it to the right by making it like work reliably inside your organization. Yeah. Like it may have been just to be able to sense connections in order to find speakers. But what happens is when something moves to the right, it starts to enable other value. Like yeah. it can be used as a Lego brick in a giant you know, uh, creation that you don't know could exist yet. And so when that's a building block, people are going to build stuff with it. <laughs> yeah. And so then you realize, oh, we have this asset now. We can use it in these other ways. We can build these other things with it. And so you could actually maybe create like an early detection warning system for when a project is, you know, requiring some kind of investment maybe or something along those lines. And that's that's pretty much what we've done. And so and, and the, the interesting thing about it is we've done it outside of um, the big company outside of Microsoft, which owns GitLab. I'm sure that 
that they have something like this already baked into the back end and they can they can mm. watch this from all of the millions of projects <laughs> and we just started doing it from our community point of view because we needed to make sense of that landscape diagram and see because there's what happens for us is that the ecosystem grows so big there's no way that one person or even a group of people can know all the players and so exactly it was, it was an unknowable thing and so these yep. tools that we used to do network analysis helped us find these people because otherwise it was a needle in a haystack, gut instinct, or asking favors of friends. And um, now there's a real easy way for me and anyone else that you know who's using these this tooling and network analysis to do this. And it has lots of other implications for other things. But I I'm pretty sure that all of the a number of the other companies that are doing source code stuff have had this baked in the background. I just never had it as a community development person. Before access to it. So we built it. It's all open source. We can talk about that another day. The That's other cool. thing that was really interesting in watching some of, some of the Wardley videos before was there was one story um, that Simon told about um, weighing paper forms to figure out the count. <laughs> yeah. And, and I don't know. I mean, I probably won't get it right, and I'll paraphrase it. But basically, they did this diagram, and then they saw the whole middle piece that everybody was concentrating on was basically not necessary, right? It was just this exercise in, you know, figuring out how much the paper weighs. And if you went down and you really mapped the whole thing out, the digital transformation was actually like, let's wipe out all this weighing the number of paper forms that have filled out as pieces of paper to going to where they enter them on the website and just taking the count. And that I think was a very powerful story for me on the, the value of Wardley mapping is that once you do that, then you really kind of see maybe that your idea and, and, and uh, of digital transformation um, might not be what you know you think it is, right? And, and I think that's the power. This visualization technique is showing you, you know, sometimes the craziness in your um, chaos too. Yeah, it, it really, it gives us the opportunity to be humane in our organizations. It's like, how how many people are working in jobs and, and working on projects that might be interesting from like a material stance, like, oh, I get to learn this technology or I'm building this thing and I, I get to be a good developer or, or what have you, but are, are in the grand scheme not like materially meaningful. Yeah. And when we when we find those those things like, oh, you're just like, oh, we have this whole section of the organization that's weighing paper to in order to get the count of pages. Uh, w why? Like, how much? How many wonderful different things could those people be doing? And but then, of course, the problem is like in many cases we don't have like organizations that can teach people new skills. So, so part of like what really motivates me about sharing worldly mapping is it, it creates the opportunity for us to create more purposeful organizations. Mm -hmm. But the 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 sort of implication is that we also have to create organizations that are, are organizations where people can learn. And I know um, Andrew Clay Schaefer has some really good talks on this. Um, for example, there is no talent shortage, which points at this thing exactly. It's like organizations that are creating the future become graduate studies in the kinds of the futures that they're trying to create. Like anyone can come in and learn stuff and be, become able to able to do these kinds of things. And so with mapping as a way to focus where we want to learn mm -hmm. we can really create more intentional organizations that are capable of producing better outcomes. And I guess it betrays my uh, my belief, my, my fundamental optimism. I think if people were just able to be more purposeful and if tools like this can help in that sense, I think we do a lot more good and we'd have a lot more like terrible things in the world like children in cages and things like that. So that's uh, that's what motivates me about this. Yeah, I think that it's really interesting, especially in the in COVID times, in the middle of a pandemic. Um, we like internally, everybody is shifting. That, for example, from face to face, uh, you know, summits and events where we all would gather in large convention centers and share. Our, I'd always walk away from there with a cold every time. Mm -hmm. You know, you shake hands with eighteen thousand people, and we have whole teams of people in lots of companies that our event managers, event planners, and all of these folks. And one of the things that is kind of wonderful about Red Hat is that we're what we're watching inside is 
the shifting of gears to a virtual world and a virtual reality and the retraining of people who have massive skills in events and stuff like that um, and understand the dynamics of you know good peer-to-peer -peer engaged events and applying those skills and those understandings but also learning how to do all of that with new virtual platforms and yeah. and, and and like I can right now see like having a conversation with, you know, within Red Hat about, you know, where are we at with this? You know, what what could we do better? And, you know, where, you know, where are we missing things, you know? And yeah. and, that's, and that's, you know, and I think pretty much every I think it I think you put the the nail on the head or whatever it is, or you hit the nail on the head around um I think wordly mapping gives us a way to do it humanely. Um, and um, with purpose. Um, and yeah, I'm not telling you what to do. You and I are coming to a shared understanding of what is. Yeah, and, and what needs to be, you know, and in some ways, um, like the rise of AI and robotics is going to replace every human's job and, you know, no one will have work or be employed. I mean, there's that fear factor of change, right? And, and things like these tools um, really help us understand you know where the technology is where you know where the potential revenue could be where and as i am a canadian where the hockey puck is going so that <laughs> we continue to go there and um, um make the best of it and put our resources this and there's so many more layers to the wardley stuff as well i mean i might have to argue with you another time that there should be two axes here um because <laughs> i think one of the things that he talked about and you've done it here with this is um like a map, uh, a diagram uh, doesn't have any uh, space. You know, it has no space component to it. And the other, the other axes um, helps us put time and space together. Uh, you know, what we've got is time here, but um, where they are, I think there's another whole conversation of um, about that. You know, where, where we'll have to get into that. Yeah, <laughs> we have to dig into that one too. So yeah. So I just wanted to check. Do we didn't? It looks like we didn't have any questions. So, or at least, um, unless you've seen something in chat. Yeah, I, I've been well, taking taking some of the chat stuff and and working them into my. Lovely, awesome. So, um, so there you go. Yeah. Everyone in the world who's watching this right now who wants to learn worthy mapping is welcome to direct message me on Twitter at Hired Thought, or if you want to email me uh, another way you can find me is Ben at HiredThought.com. I. I'm so grateful that Diane, Diane um, in, invited me to talk about worldly mapping here. If you want to learn more, um, learnworthymapping.com is a website that I run. I will help connect you with all the right resources. Please, um, I love hearing from you. I lo love hearing your questions, and I'm writing about them too, so that should be great. And as I always say, Transformation Fridays make my week. I love <laughs> ending on these kinds of conversations. This is so um, special and a wonderful way to to really, you know, we spend as technologists all week long trying to make things work and breaking things and, and you know, putting out releases and stuff like that. And then what we really um, like to focus is focus on, on on Thursdays is how are we um, as organizations leveraging this technology and levering it, uh, leveraging it well in humane mm. and sustainable and purposeful ways. And thank you, Ben, because this has been really very, very enlightening and um, we're going to have an ongoing conversation about, um, and maybe I can coerce the CNCF into hiring you to do a, a group hug conversation. <laughs> uh, I love hugs. <laughs> I, uh, I can't do them now. <laughs> right now. Virtual hug here. Yeah. So thank you very much for taking the time today to be with us. So, um, Diana, I'm so grateful. Thank you for having me. All right. Take care. Take care. Get lots of thank yous and.